start off, can you please um, tell us why you started um, 10X Future Technologies? Well, you know, I worked in financial services for over 30 years and all around the world and managed lots of businesses. And I was always intrigued by technology and financial services because it never really seemed to make a difference. It just seemed to add, you know, more costs, more complexity. It didn't really change the user experience. Um, it didn't really make it better for the bank's economics. It didn't create more transparency or trust in society. And I always ask myself, why is that? Because if you go back to the mid-90s when you know, the internet really started to take off, technology has progressively changed our lives in very profound ways, but not in financial services. Um, and it seemed to me that the underlying reason for that was because the capability of the technology hadn't evolved to a point that it could be transformational, and the, the cost point, the price point, was just too high. Um, but then sort of interesting things started to happen around mobile. And um, with mobile, of course, the combination of smartphone technology, um, uh, API-driven uh, software, and 3 and 4G gave you the ability to put the bank in your pocket. In Asia, we see some of these um, uh, mobile-first banks um, just you know, leapfrogging in terms of technology and in terms of innovation. Um, and while we do have some of those challenger banks in the UK and in Europe, um, is it just a, a, a local optimization, or is it, um, or is the um, a, a revolution going to happen in the back office, or is are these challenger banks actually going to properly disrupt? Well, I, I guess the short answer is um, it's 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 going to be all of the above, yeah. uh, and it's very difficult, of course, to predict the future. Uh, but I have, I have written about what I describe as a series of uber moments in the financial services industry where the technology suddenly hits a point of, of creating you know, profound transformation uh, in, the, in the customer experience and the economics of the industry. Um, my sense is that we are at the, the end of the beginning of this revolution, right? So we've had lots of businesses uh, be stood up. Um, some of them are quite good, some of them are not very good. Uh, but they are all starting to build learning about what is possible. And, of course, the pace of technology can change continues to, to increase. And when you put those two things together, I, I expect to see a wave of transformation over the coming years. Uh, no doubt uh, some of the challenger banks will break through. There's no doubt about that in my mind. Um, some of them won't. Um, some of the capabilities that are being built very specifically, like the ones you're working on, I think are going to cut through because they're, they're solving real problems. Uh, and I think platforms like we're building at 10X will cut through. I also think that in the very long term, uh, we can imagine a fundamental re-architecting of the banking system in a, in a much more profound way and to your opening remarks, a way that's frankly much more transparent, fairer, but crucially lower cost. And so the technologies now, which are very embryonic, like uh, distributed ledger and machine learning, these are going to play a very significant role in the future, I think. And so what, what sort of views do you think of yours run counter to your peers? Well, I guess it depends who you define as my peers <laughs> these days. But um, I mean, look, the the problem for, and I'm sure, there are, I'm sure there are people from banks in the room, so if you're from a bank, I, I apologize, but um, you know, it's the problem of the incumbent. Uh, and if you look across uh, industries that have been profoundly impact by impacted by technological change, it is seldom the incumbent that is able to morph into the new way of doing business. And the reason for that is not because um, the incumbents don't have smart people, don't have huge brands, don't have massive financial resources. They have all of those things. But the ability to imagine business being done in a fundamentally different way in your category is very hard. And so we all can cite the examples of Kodak, who invented digital photography, or Nokia, who invented the smartphone long before Apple had, or Blockbuster. You know, all of these companies that uh, in many ways defined their category at a point in time then went on to lose their market position. Now, banks are different. I accept that. I mean, banks in many ways are protected by regulation. 
uh, even though um, it's, it's common that people in banking complain about regulation. But actually, the bigger issue is this fundamental cultural way of reimagining um, doing business differently. And if you think about the UK, uh, when I talk about the end of the beginning, uh, we're now seeing branch traffic fall in the UK at 15% per annum. I mean, that is an astonishing uh, rate of, of fall in branch traffic. And if you compound that out, the impact on that cost base is very, very significant. Uh, cash out of ATMs is going down. Uh, and that, again, if you comp compound that out, gives a very difficult set of problems for the incumbents because you've got to maintain all of that cost, um, but you've got less and less business going over it. So I do think we're going to see uh, some very, very significant change uh, across, across the industry. We'll see different types of organisations being successful, different models being successful. And in many ways, I think, as I said, in the far future, you can see a fundamentally different banking structure. Almost everything that you've said is about sort of where the opportunity is. <clears throat> what I would uh, ask is there's some serious, seriously impressive players who are starting to get involved in blockchain in, uh, in, in some of these new technologies. You know, um, where do you see the white space? Where do you see the, the opportunity that nobody else is sort of trying to, 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 to attack? My, my advice to anybody who wants to answer that question is to think about two things. Um, so firstly, think about data. Uh, financial services is just, is just data. Yeah, every financial product is just data. I mean, your business is all about data. Um, but if you think about a payment, it's basically just data. You know, transfer that resource from me to you. A mortgage is just data. A loan is just data. So firstly, think about the data and how it flows. And secondarily, again, I go back to take the time to understand how the fundamental technologies that, that underpin all of this are changing and moving. And they're moving very, very fast now. So if you put those two ideas together, um, and you think about distributed ledger technology, the, the white space there is that everybody is talking about it, and there's a bit of hype around it, but actually the use cases are quite narrow uh, at the moment. Um, the best use case is Bitcoin. Um, and full disclosure, I'm on the board of blockchain, and they're the largest player in Bitcoin wallets. But you know, the Bitcoin is really an embryonic demonstration that you can move money and value around on a distributed ledger platform. So if you extend that thinking into the way banking works, um, banking is basically an intermediation function. So if it was just you and I in the world and you had money and I needed money, we wouldn't need a bank. You know, you'd lend me the money, we'd agree the terms and so on. But because there's tens of millions of us in the UK and billions of people on the planet, we need a banking system. And the way banking works is basically through a set of intermediation steps. So I go to my bank, I put my money in my current account, the bank then does something with that, goes through the bank, goes through the central banking system, goes to another bank, goes to somebody on the other end of that process. That is a set of intermediation steps which are very expensive, not just in terms of operational uh, cost uh, and cost of rework when things go wrong, but it's also very expensive in terms of the capital that you need to support that system because quite rightly regulators insist that there's a set of capital buffers to protect against things going wrong in the middle. If you fast forward and think about distributed ledger technology, you could imagine a re-architecting of that where basically we get back to the world where there's just you and me in it, because that technology can connect us both in a uh, cryptographically protected, immutable way. And that opens up uh, a lot of opportunity when you go back to my point about data. Um, so peer-to-peer -peer lending, um, which you know, is again a nascent category in my view, has established the idea that um, if you've got money and I need money, we can lend it without bank intermediation. But it's very difficult to scale that right now, and it just sits on top of the existing banking system. Once you kind of plug out the existing banking system and put in a DLT structure, you can imagine a system that's instant, 
very low cost and where risk is, it's not minimized, but because it's distributed, you don't need the sort of capital that has to sit at the center of the system. So that's one area where I think we can begin to see different use cases. Um, now, that there's a lot of thinking on, on distributed ledger, which is about trying to solve problems inside the system. Um, I think that's interesting, but I think that's not really where the big opportunity is. I think the big opportunity is replacing the system in its entirety. You said, um, you know, when I asked you the question of, of what sort of one of your views that's sort of counterintuitive to your peers, um, you mentioned who are my peers, but one of the things that I think um, is really counterintuitive is that you've built this business with the fundamental belief that these technologies should be open, that these technologies um, do better um, the world and they create a more equitable um, uh, you know, society. Can you sort of uh, elaborate on yeah, sure. some of that? Sure. Yeah, I start from the belief that uh, the financial system is a kind of, it's fundamental uh, because if you don't have an effective financial system, you can't have vibrant and growing economies, and without that, you can't have stable and successful and happy societies. So it's a really important place to start. I think the more you can squeeze out cost from the system, the more you can improve decision-making in the system, the more you can uh, create a fairer system. So one thing that we were doing on Friday was we were meeting with some folks who uh, work with uh, people who are trying to get themselves back into employment. And there are two issues there. One is zero hours contracts, which means that basically you don't know until the app pings whether you've got work that day or not. Uh, and the other is uh, the fact that people then uh, can't get into debt repayment planning because uh, if you have a repayment plan with a creditor today, they want you to commit to making, you know, I want you to pay £10 a week, I want you to pay, you know, £40 a month. And so if you think about that problem, again, think about it from a data and a technology problem. Well, why, why can't you essentially API that person's work records that are coming from their employer I'm not talking about zero hours contracts, whether they're a good thing or not, that's a different debate. But why not API that to a lender so they can actually track you know, what your hours are and then form a view as to, oh, I see you had 30 hours this week, so maybe you can pay £10. You know, next week you only have 15, so maybe you only pay £5. So that kind of dynamic set of relationships, which will inevitably mean that you can provide credit to much less credit-worthy users at much lower cost uh, and in a more dynamic and flexible way. And that's just one of the sort of use cases that you can imagine. Access to the banking system, again, is very, very difficult for people at the, low, at the very low end of the income or no income spectrum. And although banks now have an obligation to provide something called a basic bank account, I mean, it doesn't work that well for most people. So you know, these are some of the problems that we can solve. And interestingly, what you're doing, I mean, pro providing better data on the state of entity allows better credit decisions to be made. Completely. And therefore lower cost credit decisions and therefore businesses get lending at cheaper cost and therefore you get a benefit in economic growth and so on. So this, this work that's going on in the fintech space is not, you know, it's not sort of nice kind of uh, thing about, you know, well, there are going to be loads of unicorns and all of that. Um, and this is really about how we create a fairer, more effective banking system and therefore more prosperous economies around the world. And I know we're running out of time, but you know, if you look at uh, what's happening in the developing world and you go to Kenya and you look at what's been achieved with M-Pesa, which is you know, a very, very basic but very clever payment system riding on the Safaricom network, I mean, that has been transformational for the economy there. So I'm, I'm hugely optimistic about the future. And it's too expensive being poor. No. It's too expensive being poor, exactly. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. We really appreciate it. <laughs>